ex worker. An audio strike against a monotone world. A twice monthly podcast of anarchist ideas and action. For everyone who dreams of a life off the clock. Welcome back to The Ex Worker. This time, we'll begin a two episode series exploring anarchism in Chile. We'll start with an extended discussion of the historical context of dictatorship, neoliberal democracy, and resistance in Chile, as well as several interviews with Chilean anarchists about their book fair in Santiago, the role of radical neighborhoods in contemporary struggles, the state of political imprisonment, and lots more. On September 11, 2014, patriotic Americans were putting up flags and listening to somber speeches urging us to never forget. On the same day, a few thousand miles south, Chileans were urging each other to remember a very different event etched on the collective consciousness. Mass protesters built barricades on the streets of Santiago, torching vehicles and tossing Molotov cocktails at riot police, who responded with tear gas and rubber bullets. Ten people were arrested and six police injured. Every year on this date, thousands flocked to the streets across the country to remember and mourn the open wound of military dictatorship and commemorate the resistance that continues to this day. What happened 41 years ago that left such an indelible print on the people of Chile? How is the historical memory deployed by radicals, not as a force to cement nationalism or justify wars, but as an inspiration for revolutionary visions and a catalyst to ongoing struggles? How are anarchists in Chile today grappling with the legacies of repression through dictatorship and democracy? In this episode, we turn our vision southwards to learn more about the Chilean anarchist movement, its roots in the years of dictatorship, the strategies used against it by the state, its emphasis on militant individual and small group actions, and support for political prisoners, and how it remembers in order to keep fighting. Chile is the longest country in the world. It stretches from the dusty northern deserts near the Peruvian border to the chilly windswept lakes of the far south, all the way down to Antarctica. In between, nearly 18 million people comprise a country hailed by some as one of South America's success stories, one of its most prosperous and economically free nations. Or so the statisticians and pundits tell us. The streets tell us a different story of a country still aching from a 17-year military dictatorship whose leader may have been deposed, but whose institutions live on in nearly every facet of Chilean society. A neoliberal nightmare of intense inequalities enforced by violent militarized police and widespread surveillance. Which story you tell or believe depends on where you're positioned in relation to Chile's so-called economic miracle. The hills and valleys of South Central Chile are home to the indigenous Mapuche, a people who were never conquered by the Spanish, whose lands were never ceded in a treaty. Their ongoing resistance to colonialism remains one of the most active strains of rebellion in Chile today. Santiago, the country's capital and largest city, contains one of the highest concentration of radicals and hosts many of the largest demonstrations and actions. Much of our story will take place there, though anarchist resistance appears in Valparaiso, Concepcion, and other urban and rural areas too. In this and the next episode, we'll share a number of interviews with Chilean anarchists about the context for their struggles against the state and capitalism. 
Because Chilean anarchist movements hold such a strong sense of history and memory, we'll begin with a look back in time to provide some context for resistance today. To set the stage, we draw on a 2009 article that appeared in Rolling Thunder 8, titled Chile, From Popular Power to Social War, and connect the historical background to contemporary developments. On The Ex Worker, we've often reported news from Chile, repression cases, social unrest, bombings, militant actions, and so forth. We hope that these episodes will offer context to understand them and insight into one of the most distinctive and militant anarchist movements in the world today. Political discourse in Chile, from politicians and capitalist media to revolutionary circles, is largely dominated by the legacy of the military dictatorship. For 17 years, Chileans lived under the rule of General Augusto Pinochet. The coup d'etat that brought him to power was backed by the U.S. government. Upon seizing power, the military murdered thousands, tortured tens of thousands, and forced hundreds of thousands more into political exile. This continued until the dictatorship was slowly phased out between 1988 and 1990. The role of the U.S. in establishing military rule in Chile is part of a larger program of supporting anti-communist dictatorships throughout Latin America, including Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Bolivia. To understand the military coup in its aftermath, we have to begin by looking at Cold War politics in Latin America. Through the first half of the 20th century, the United States government repeatedly deployed troops to secure corporate investments and depose potentially disobedient regimes, as in Panama, Nicaragua, and Cuba. In the 1930s, under the so-called Good Neighbor Policy, the U.S. declared it would no longer undertake military interventions in the region. But, as the Cold War set in after 1945, U.S. anxiety to maintain its dominance over its southern neighbors relative to the Soviet Union led to increased use of diplomatic pressure, economic sanctions, and covert intervention, as exerted during regime changes in Guatemala, Ecuador, and El Salvador. While official rhetoric praised democracy and free elections, the U.S. feared that Marxist electoral victories would destabilize their political and economic control of Latin America. In response, the U.S. crafted a program called the Alliance for Progress to empower centrist parties across Latin America. Chile was a key target of this new program. Through the mid-20th century, the democratic system in Chile was divided into three key blocks, the electoral left, the center, and the right. The center block was critical in deciding ruling coalitions and the presidency. To gain the presidency, a candidate had to work with a wide range of smaller parties and convince the Congress to approve him in the absence of a clear majority. On the left, the most determined coalition builder was Salvador Allende. Although influenced by anarchism during his youth, he co-founded the Socialist Party in 1933 and ran unsuccessfully for president many times. In the 1958 election, Allende tried again, narrowly losing out to the right-wing National Party's candidate. He failed again in 1964, losing this time to the centrist Christian Democrat candidate, whose party had received $4 million in covert financing from the U.S. government. This funding would increase even higher in the next election. In 1970, Allende ran for the presidency on the ticket of a new coalition of left parties, the Popular Unity. He was once again in tight competition with the right-wing candidate, with the U.S. government following the contest closely. This time, Allende gained a narrow plurality with 36.6% of the vote. A secret 1970 CIA document discussing a plan to prevent Allende from successfully assuming power stated... President Nixon decided that an Allende regime in Chile was not acceptable to the United States. The president asked the agency to prevent Allende from coming to power or to unseat him. The president authorized $10 million for this purpose if needed. Further, the agency is to carry out this mission without coordination from the departments of state or defense. The U.S. government developed two plans to prevent Allende from assuming the presidency. The first was to leverage fears of a totalitarian communist state to dissuade the Chilean Congress from accepting Allende's victory. This failed when the Congress approved Allende in a last-minute decision after he signed a document affirming his support for the Chilean Constitution. 
The second CIA plan aimed to create the conditions for direct military intervention. Allende's victory heralded a period of increased social tensions. The new government undertook a series of reforms and nationalized the vast copper mines in the northern part of the country. Meanwhile, segments of the Chilean bourgeoisie began a campaign to undermine the popular unity coalition. For example, shop owners falsely claimed food shortages to spread fear of economic collapse and hyperinflation. The Chilean right also employed more direct approaches. A right-wing organization called Patria y Libertad formed to combat revolutionaries during street demonstrations. Although the new president was a constitutionalist and a reformist, more militant groups used this moment to mobilize their forces. One key group, the Revolutionary Left Movement, or MIR, was an armed organization formed in 1965 by radical students with revolutionary tendencies, including some anarchists. The MIR later declared itself Marxist-Leninist. While the statist Allendista movement promoted the idea of the Via Pacifica, the peaceful way, revolutionary elements pushed direct conflict with the bourgeoisie. The MIR rejected the theory of the peaceful way because it politically disarms the proletariat, because the bourgeoisie will choose totalitarian dictatorship in civil war before peacefully giving up power. Their words would prove prophetic. In this polarizing atmosphere, with revolutionary endeavors and right-wing conspiracies grappling for influence, a faction of the military undertook a failed coup on June 29, 1973, raising tensions in Santiago even higher. General Augusto Pinochet, head of the Chilean army, though opposed to this initial attempt, helped lead the successful coup d'etat on September 11th. While the CIA directly supported the coup, there was domestic support for it among the Chilean bourgeoisie, political right, and centrist parties. Members of the centrist electoral bloc believed that the military would take power only temporarily before returning it to the political structures from before popular unity rule. In Allende's final radio address, he requested that leftists, students, and workers not raise an armed resistance to the military. Nonetheless, the MIR and other militant groups assisted in the armed defense of the Poblaciones, the poor neighborhoods on the outskirts of Santiago that were raided by the military during the coup d'etat. The military regime did not immediately hand power over to the center and right-wing electoral blocs. In fact, they would hold it for 17 bloody years. The armed forces quickly organized a ruling junta, including all branches of the military and police, with Pinochet as the head. The military government justified the coup as a preemptive measure against Plan Z, an alleged popular unity coalition plot for armed communist revolution, which has never been substantiated. The new regime created a list of suspected communists and subversives in the country. Many of these were detained and executed or tortured. Some went underground to combat the new regime. Others went into exile. After the repression of the early 1970s, many Chileans were afraid to participate in illegal street demonstrations. The 1980s, however, brought a resurgence of political activity against the military regime. The MIR re-emerged as a political force, and two other armed organizations formed in the 1980s, the FPMR, a wing of the Communist Party, and a militant faction of the Mapu from the popular unity era called Mapu Lautaro. All three organizations engaged in armed actions during the dictatorship. This period saw a new phase of open conflict and also produced emblematic stories of repression. On March 29, 1985, two young brothers, Rafael and Eduardo Vergara Toledo, both militants of the MIR, were gunned down by police as they walked through the Poblacion Villa Francia, a neighborhood known to be a center of resistance to the dictatorship. The anniversary of the murder of the Vergara brothers was marked for years to come, both privately and publicly, and the date eventually became known as Día del Joven Combatiente, the Day of the Youth Combatant, an occasion known across Chile and now across the world as a result of the political militancy and dedication of the victims' surviving relatives. Their parents, Luisa Toledo and Manuel Vergara, continue to give passionate speeches in support of revolutionary movements, including anarchist efforts. Their granddaughter, Tamara Sol Vergara, has been in prison since the beginning of 2014, accused of shooting at a bank security guard in a solidarity action. (music) 
The 1980s witnessed a division among the opponents of the military regime. Many reformist groups proposed an unarmed transition to bourgeois democracy, while more revolutionary elements proposed an armed insurrection against the capitalist state. An assassination attempt against Pinochet by the FPMR in 1986 forced this debate to the foreground. The Constitution of 1980, approved in a rigged plebiscite, required the dictatorship to hold a referendum on the regime in 1988. The reformist opposition seized this opportunity to wage a successful campaign for the no vote against the ruling dictatorship. The ruling classes in Chile embraced the return to a democratic state rather than face the possibility of an insurrection. The transition to democracy took place between 1988 and 1990. Under the new system, the Socialist Party and other political parties began open negotiations with members of the former dictatorship. The Communist Party was written out of the process, but supported it anyway, hoping to gain more access to the political system further down the road. In one attempt to pursue this objective, they called for the FPMR to disarm. Some factions of the organization turned in their guns, while others did not. With the reintroduction of democracy to Chile, the bourgeoisie found a new solution to the challenge of having three traditional electoral blocs. La Concertación de Partidos por la Democracia, originally formed as a coalition of centrist and center-left parties for the no vote, became the new dominant regime. It continues to rule to this day. The political right formed a coalition called the Alianza por Chile, which includes numerous figures from the former military dictatorship. This created a system that no longer involved a split between three electoral blocs, thus preventing electoral left parties from gaining power via the political system. The Socialist Party of the deceased Allende embraced the neoliberal policies introduced by the Pinochet dictatorship. The Concertación, including the Socialist Party and the Christian Democratic Party, began an international campaign to change Chile's image from a military dictatorship to a successful neoliberal democracy. Sociologists report that today, Chileans are most indifferent of all people in the Americas about democracy versus dictatorship as forms of government. We might interpret this as a recognition on the part of many Chileans that democracy was not fundamentally an interruption of or replacement for dictatorship, but a continuation of its logic by other means. There are profound continuities between capitalist dictatorship under Pinochet and capitalist democracy under the Concertación, pursuing many of the same neoliberal policies and defended by the same repressive police forces. In the 1990s, the state shifted from criminalizing revolutionaries as communists to defaming them as terrorists, framing the new democracy as a stable alternative to insurrection or war. During this period, newspapers were filled with articles about armed actions and suspected terrorist activity, and the Concertación took on the role of the former dictatorship in condemning these groups. Cells of the FPMR, the MIR, and the Mapu Lotaro continued armed activity against the new democratic regime which responded with the same tactics the dictatorship had utilized, killing, torturing, and murdering militants. Mapu Lotaro, in particular, suffered much infiltration and repression in the early 1990s. With a significant part of the organization locked up, they focused much of their energy organizing inside prison, including a youth faction that formed a collective of prisoners called Camina Libre. In the late 1990s, groups of young anarchists outside of prison began doing support work for political prisoners, including Camina Libre. Consequently, many ex-militants from the group went on to leave prison, influenced by libertarian ideas and critical of authoritarian politics, a pivotal development in the Chilean anarchist movement. While anarchists have been present throughout the history of political struggle in Chile, Marxist and reformist organizations dominated during the dictatorship and into the early 1990s. At the end of the 1990s, the Congreso de Unificación Anarcocomunista formed, and over the course of the early 2000s, other organizations, such as the Organización Comunista Libertaria, emerged from the platformist tradition. Since then, the development of anarchist practice in Chile has included both platformist and insurrectionary perspectives. Many anarchists in Chile look positively upon Latin American insurrectionary figures, such as the Argentine Severino de Giovanni, active during the 1920s. Underground communiques written after recent bombings and attacks in Santiago are often signed by affinity groups that use the names of these individuals. 
Anti-authoritarian ideas gained prominence in revolutionary movements in Chile as the anti-globalization movement gained influence, reaching a height during the APEC conference in late 2004. The legacy of the MIR, Mapu Lataro, and other armed groups has left Chile with a context for militant action unique in Latin America. Most armed revolutionary groups from the second half of the 20th century in the region followed the FOCO strategy, inspired by Che Guevara, in which a vanguard of small armed cadres was expected to provide a focal point for popular discontent and catalyze a general insurrection. This proved the dominant model for insurgent groups in Bolivia, Colombia, Guatemala, and numerous other countries. In Chile, by contrast, on the eve of the dictatorship, although armed cadres were present, the strongest revolutionary tendency was what was known as popular power, self-organization through factory takeovers, land occupations, and such. When underground and armed guerrilla groups intensified their activity towards the end of the dictatorship, they escalated its decline, but provided the reformist opposition with an opportunity to pose the transition to democracy as a stable alternative to insurrection and civil war. The militant groups who refused to disarm found themselves abandoned by the communists and other left parties and repressed by the security forces of the democratic government. This, along with the evolution of imprisoned militants in libertarian directions and the legacy of popular power, has contributed to a distinctive brand of militancy in Chile. Contemporary militant struggle has a decentralized and libertarian character, strongly influenced by insurrectionary anarchist ideas. Beyond the frequent street clashes between police and encapuchados, or masked ones, small affinity groups and individuals have undertaken dozens, if not hundreds, of small bombings and attacks against the state and capitalist targets, most commonly banks and police stations or barracks. Communiques often dedicate actions to imprisoned anarchists in Chile and across the world. Chilean anarchists devote considerable energy to supporting or remembering militants who have faced repression or died in the course of armed struggles. One high-profile example from recent years is the Banco Security case. After an armed robbery and shootout in 2007 in which a police officer was killed, five militants formerly of the Mapu Lotaro were targeted by the state. Marcelo Villarroel, a former member of Camina Libre and longtime political prisoner, along with Freddy Fuentevilla and Juan Aliste, were arrested and detained without trial for several years before finally being sentenced this summer to long prison terms. Also widely remembered is Mauricio Morales, or Punky Mari, a young anarchist student who died in a bomb explosion in 2009. Anarchist Sebastián Oversluis Seguel was killed by a bank security guard in December 2013 during an attempted bank expropriation. These and other imprisoned or dead anarchists are commemorated regularly at rallies and cited in communiques for actions. <laughs> Since the time of Pinochet, people have engaged in protests and riots on various anniversaries. September 11th, the date of the 1973 military coup, continues to be one of these days of combat. In a tradition originating from the era of the dictatorship, thousands march every year from downtown Santiago to the General Cemetery, where there is a memorial for the victims of the military regime. Police still use military machinery to repress protesters the same way they did before the transition to democracy. The Fuerzas Especiales of the Carabineros, which are basically highly equipped riot police, can be seen downtown on a daily basis. They generally keep a distance from protesters, instead relying on their armored vehicles to direct the crowd. Police on foot will only approach crowds in large teams. Individual police are at risk of being attacked by protesters. Anarchists regularly protest and clash with police in downtown Santiago. In some years, the September 11th protest involves intense riots in which militants attack banks and businesses with Molotov cocktails. In 2006, a masked protester threw a Molotov cocktail at La Moneda, the presidential palace. Although it didn't cause any structural damage, it resulted in a wave of sensationalist reports in the capitalist press and raids against a squatted social center in a politically active university. The youth faction of the Communist Party also spoke out against the attack on the La Moneda and claimed that they would forcibly prevent anarchists from disrupting future marches. However, the protests have continued every September 11th since, and the communist youth have not succeeded in playing the role of protest police in Chile. In Santiago, some of the public universities have a strong tradition of protest culture, extending back to before the popular unity period. The massive traditional universities were broken up by the dictatorship into smaller schools in an attempt to maintain control over the rebellious student population. 
The dictatorship regularly attacked students at the universities from outside the gates. The democratic state continues to do this today. Students regularly meet in spokes councils to plan strikes and occupations of their departments and sometimes occupy entire universities. Under the democratic regime, the protests have focused on reformist demands regarding the educational system, but some elements use these protests as opportunities for broader agitation. Over recent years, anarchists have become increasingly influential in student protests. Currently, groups from various anarchist traditions participate. There are formal organizations, such as the Libertarian Student Front, as well as insurrectionary anarchists who reject formal organization. In response to student protests, Carabineros indiscriminately fire tear gas onto the campus and charge the school gates with armored vehicles. Riot police also regularly fire tear gas canisters at the bodies of demonstrators, a tactic that took the life of young anarchist Daniel Menko at a university demonstration in northern Chile in 1999. Despite this, the schools remain territories of rebellion. Confrontational protests occur on politicized campuses year-round, but more regularly on traditional dates of protest, such as September 11th and the Day of the Youth Combatant. Administrators often close the campuses down on these dates, and revolutionary students now protest throughout the month. September 11th is giving way to Black September. The universities are not the only part of the school system to engage in militant protest. The Escolares, high school-age students who study at Liceos, have a long history of protest extending back past dictatorship and continue to be a powerful social force. In 2006, they initiated one of the most significant waves of protests since the transition to democracy. Over 700,000 students went on strike against the organic law on teaching, which further privatized the education system. It was the last law Pinochet put into place before handing power over to the democracy in 1990. The massive protests against the law were the culmination of many years of organizing marches, strikes, and school occupations. In 2006, this exploded into the streets, with resurgences over the following years. A crucial dimension of resistance to the Chilean state today is the struggle of the Mapuche, a group of indigenous peoples who successfully resisted Spanish occupation during the colonization of South America. Early maps of Chile show Walmapu as an autonomous territory. Walmapu remained relatively independent until the army engaged in a campaign called the Pacification in the late 19th century. This military intervention resulted in the deaths of many Mapuche people, and large tracts of land were handed over to people of European descent. The contemporary conflict in Wamapu is not a re-emergence of indigenous resistance, but a continuation of a war that never ended. Today, Mapuche communities clash with national and multinational corporations that claim to hold land that is traditionally part of Wamapu. Some communities have successfully regained large amounts of land after decades of struggle. The conflict focuses on forestry and farming plantations, mines, and dams. In numerous cases, forestry plantations have been set on fire by encapuchados. In response, the democratic government began utilizing a dictatorship-era anti-terrorism law to target Mapuche communities and organizations. The law allows the use of unidentified witnesses who can have their voices scrambled and their faces obscured while testifying. As a result of this campaign of government repression, there are numerous Mapuche political prisoners. Anarchists continually engage in solidarity actions concerning the conflict, including regular marches and attacks dedicated to Mapuche political prisoners. Since the time of Pinochet's rule, residents of the Poblaciones have engaged in armed defense of their neighborhoods against the military and police. The Poblaciones were originally land occupations. They have now been officially incorporated into the city after decades of struggle. The occupations were a highly politicized process, as can be seen in the culture of these spaces. In one dramatic example, the streets of the Poblacion La Victoria are named after revolutionary figures and moments in history, including the date of the land occupation, the Haymarket Martyrs, and May Day. The Poblaciones were the site of the most intense urban conflicts during the dictatorship, and all three armed organizations were highly active in the more political neighborhoods. In some of the Poblaciones, the armed groups occasionally maintained territorial control. When democratic rule returned, the ungovernable neighborhoods presented a threat to the new system. Clashes still occur in some of the more politicized Poblaciones. 
on September 11th, combative poblaciones go into revolt across Santiago, and the entrances are secured with burning barricades. The police are generally afraid to enter the hearts of these neighborhoods, but they will engage in conflict on the outskirts. These actions bring together revolutionaries, including anarchists, with disenfranchised youth who are not otherwise politically active. Sometimes demonstrators cause power outages in order to gain the advantage over the police, who are less familiar with the terrain and hesitant to navigate it in the dark. These tactics originated during protests against the Pinochet regime. Police utilize more violent tactics in the poblaciones than they do against protests downtown or outside the universities, even firing live ammunition. In some neighborhoods, demonstrators respond with guns as well. Confrontations in the poblaciones are not limited to September 11th. They occur during most periods of protest, including the Day of the Youth Combatant. Although these protests started in the Villa Francia, where the Vergara brothers were killed, they now occur throughout the poblaciones, and in recent years, they have spread to other Chilean cities. To understand the significance of Villa Francia and the resistance of the poblaciones in Chile, an ex-worker caught up with Fabian, who explains more about the history of the neighborhood and the role it plays for antagonists to the state and capitalism in Santiago. We're here at the third anarchist book fair in Santiago, Chile, and today we're speaking with Fabian. And where are we right now, Fabian? Right now we're in El Lingue, a cultural center located in the neighborhood of Via Francia, on the east side of Santiago, Chile. And what is the importance of Via Francia to the anarchist movement here in Santiago and in the rest of Chile? Chile in general. I believe that the importance of the Via is being a center of struggle in certain historical periods, and how it was created by workers, by poor people as a land occupation, who then established a neighborhood. And all of this has to do with armed groups, revolutionary groups, the Manuel Rodriguez Patriotic Front, FPMR, the Revolutionary Left Movement, MIR, and these activities, if not some of the first revolutionary advances, are still very influential on what we think of today as revolutionary struggle, the armed struggle in confronting power. Through all the years, despite all of the attempts of power to destroy the revolutionary struggle, to shut down any conflicts with power, the VIA still remains a revolutionary instinct, always. Los intentos del poder de destruir la lucha, la lucha revolucionaria, de, de destruir los conflictos hacia el, en contra del poder, desde la vía se ha mantenido el, todavía el instinto siempre. On every one of the important dates, or during other times where struggle is necessary, there is revolt, and a notion to expand the revolt. So in this sense, the Via has an important connection with the anarchists in regards to the fact that many anarchists have family in Via Francia, or many that come here from other poblaciones to attend the activities that occur here, Day of the Youth Combatant, the anniversary of the 1973 coup, and other commemorative dates or events regarding political prisoners or people murdered by the police in the Poblacion. So this place has served as a focal point from which to expand the armed struggle, the revolutionary struggle to fight the cops, against the state, against power. This tradition has served the anarchist movement, especially anarchist groups who have absorbed this history, who know the reality of the Via, who come to participate. And this has generated a sense of permanent, untiring struggle, a violent struggle against power. But besides street conflict, the struggle is maintained by other means, informative activities, counter-information, solidarity events and benefits for political prisoners. For example, here in El Linge, there are constantly different kinds of forums, shows, theater, benefit lunches and dinners to raise money for political prisoners, anarchist political prisoners, Marxist political prisoners. So in this sense, I believe that the Via Francia served as one of the more combative areas during the dictatorship and one of the most targeted areas afterwards. This has made it a site for generating struggle and has influenced the rest of the poblaciones in regards to resistance. Lots of people travel here for the 29th of March, Day of the Youth Combatant. 
Mapuche folks come, people from the north come, and all of this means you can see that there is something alive here that's not just the lies you see in the press. For example, that these are groups of unloved, uncared for children, lumpen as they disparagingly call them. But rather, there is a cause here that includes young people, yes, but adults too who have a cause, to wage war on power, the state. And I believe that this is the importance of the Via, to maintain this focal point of social war. This importance is communicated visually through the extensive graffiti and murals that cover the entire neighborhood. Fabian explains... What happens here is that, well, before, in the 1980s, on the end of every tenement block, there were magnificent murals alluding to people who came from the Via or important figures from more leftist groups. But there has always been an effort to include on every block, because the Via is made up of various tenement buildings, to include graffiti and murals that remember. Mapuche people, political prisoners, the Vergara brothers. There's a really huge piece that evokes Sol Vergara, who came from Via Francia and is the cousin of the brothers Vergara, whose murder is commemorated on Day of the Youth Combatant. So she is included in this mural to make it clear that she is still in prison and that she has support here in Via Francia. There are also other homages to political prisoners. The prisoners from the Banco Security case are in a bunch of murals to make it clear to anyone who passes by here that they are not forgotten, that we keep on resisting, and that this is a site of solidarity, and that the Via continues to battle on on behalf of political prisoners. This is basically what the graffiti and murals seek out to accomplish, to keep the streets alive. Entonces eso busca más o menos un poco los graffiti murales, mantener viva en las calles eso. In this atmosphere of resistance, anarchists undertake a wide variety of organizing, both militant and above ground. For example, the anarchist book and propaganda fair takes place in Villa Francia each year. Next, we'll hear from Kiwi and Nico about the history of the book fair and how it fits into the broader anarchist struggle in Chile. <laughs> Here we are at the third Anarchist Book Fair in Santiago, Chile, and we're speaking with two of the organizers of the book fair. Who are we speaking with? Nico. And why did you decide to hold an Anarchist Book Fair? What is its origin? What year did it start? And what are some of the original goals that you had for the book fair? Well, the book fair began in 2012, so this year, 2014, is our third. Here in Chile, since 2003 or 2004, there was what you might call a resurgence in anarchist ideas and practices. And since then, anarchism has been more visible. Something that was beginning to happen back then, although it actually helped in a way, was the press started to demonize anarchists all over the place. So anarchism itself became a more public thing. This started to generate a counter-response, and every time you had a little more initiative of this type. At first, there wasn't that much of a specifically anarchist tendency. Well, there were a few people, but lots of activity. Work in the poblaciones, squatted spaces, prisoner sport, etc., etc. Bueno, de por ahí por el 2007, 2008, también empezaron a hacer como actividades más grandes, como fue el Marzo Anarquista. Around 2007, 2008, we started to have a bigger anarchist event, which was called Anarchist March, like the month. Anarchist March was, well, obviously it was held in March, and it was a series of workshops, forums, and skill shares 
on stuff like design, anarchist history, introductions to anarchism, free schooling, a ton of stuff like that. It started in the March of 2007 and went on for a few years, like four if I'm not mistaken, and everyone liked this event because the first time that it happened, it was thought that maybe 50 people would show up to the first few events. But in the first week, over 300 people attended, so everyone was pleasantly surprised. Afterwards, anarchist march changed forms, changed people, but kept going until its end four years later. But before it ended, a few of us who had known each other for years, who had a lot of confidence in each other, got together and said, why don't we have an anarchist book fair? Why an anarchist book fair? Because in this time, there was a proliferation of anarchist texts, publishers, and there was a surge in the quantity and visibility of anarchist texts. Not that they were super available, but, say, before 2005, it was very difficult to find an anarchist book, except for the library. But in the last few years, there are more publishers and more anarchist materials publicly available. So after Anarchist March died, a few of us comrades started to talk and we said, let's have an anarchist book fair. It can be an activity that everybody gets because of its tradition all over the world. It will help raise the visibility of the propaganda that is being made, and it can be a way that people less familiar with anarchism, who see anarchists as a strange breed, can become informed. And we also saw it as an opportunity to have a little bit of debate or discussion between different anarchist tendencies, and to have this discussion not just occur internally, but also oriented towards those outside the movement. Obviously, this generated some debate amongst anarchists and anti-authoritarians, but originally the idea of the book fair was a public, big event, and to try and get out of the anarchist ghetto that, yeah, exists to a certain degree. El primer año eh, salió bien, fue mucho más gente de la que esperábamos. The first year, 2012, went great. There were a lot more people than we had expected. The space has always been in the same spot because, well, there just aren't that many spaces that will host us. Lots of publishers and people prepared new materials specifically for the book fair. It achieved being an activity that wasn't just the same as always. It raised interest. And I believe that as the first book fair was in 2012, and in 2011 there was the context of a raised level of struggle because of the student movement, the book fair really succeeded because of this, because more people started to engage in and align themselves with horizontal practices of organizing. It wasn't massive, but it started nonetheless. So there was a noticeably greater interest on the part of students in anarchism, high school students just as much as university students, and therefore a greater interest in general, like in the poblaciones. And 2012 continued to introduce new things. Barricades and other things that had been lost in 2011 were once again being used as practices of struggle. So I think 2012 was such a success because there was a climate that lent itself to greater interest in anarchism because of the social context. In fact, in 2012, there were a lot of students in attendance. In 2013, the fair was better organized, was very big again. Was it even bigger than the first one? I don't remember, but there were more people than this year. And in the second book fair, 2013, one of the things we did differently was how we thought about the children there, like in regards to the importance of thinking how their needs might be different. Of course, lots of time was given to discussing workshops about prisoners and other issues, but the organizing collective also kept in mind that kids are always present and are a part of our lives as well. So for the book fair in 2013, a child care space was created, which received lots of praise from people who liked it, but a lot of criticism too from people who called it a small jail for children. In fact, one of the kids in the child care space that year said they were there because their parents wanted them to calm down. So this year, we ran things a little differently to make sure it wasn't like a little jail, 
Rather, the idea was to have workshops for kids, to make sure we didn't replicate last year, to have it be a little different. Que la idea era como ocuparlo para hacer talleres y eso todo resultó el año pasado, pero este año fue distinto, como para que para considerarlos en los distintos espacios. Sorpresa. Eso. At the Book and Propaganda Fair, the ex-worker also spoke with Felipe, a member of the radical media project called Social Communication Productions. Felipe explained the importance of political imprisonment in Chile and prisoner support within anarchist movements. Okay, we're here at the Anarchist Book Fair in Santiago, Chile, and who are we speaking with? Bueno, mi nombre es Felipe. And what kind of project are you participating with at the book fair this weekend? I'm part of Social Communication Productions, and our group is mostly known through our video journal project Synopsis, which we have been producing since 2007. In the two previous book fairs, and now in the third, we try to put together a brief video showing what the anarchist book fair consists of. Something that I've noticed is how the book fair incorporates the presence of political prisoners and those who have died in struggle, for example, in attempted bank robberies or at the hands of the police and such. There are some large, impressive posters and a banner with prisoner profiles at the entrance of the space. For our listeners, can you explain a little bit about political repression in Chile, some of the most important cases for anarchists, and how their presence is incorporated into events like this? Sí. Bueno, la prisión política en Chile tiene un papel bastante protagonista en el desarrollo como de los movimientos sociales más radicales. Political imprisonment in Chile has a principal role in the activity of more radical social movements. Naturally, the state is repressive. In Chile, we live in a democratic dictatorship, practically speaking, which is to say that the constitution from the dictatorship is the same as we have today. So we live under the same laws that were established with the bloody dictatorship that started in 1973. At the root of this high level of repression, we have a penalty index that is maybe one of the highest in the world. For instance, the penalty against property destruction is very high. And the prison system in Chile is very strong. Although now the system is changing, currently we are starting to have more privately run prisons, which we know is a system very well established in the United States. And by the logic of this whole system by living under a police state, a repressive state, there are many comrades that, for various reasons, find themselves in prison. Fortunately, they have a lot, well, not a lot, but plenty of support to help de-invisibilize their situation. The reasons why people are in prison are diverse, and the ideologies that political prisoners have acted from are quite different. And because they are so different, there are various kinds of groups that support political prisoners. There are Mapuche political prisoners, there are prisoners from the Allendeist tendency, there are anarchist political prisoners, and there are plenty of other kinds of political prisoners. It's necessary to put work into the question of political imprisonment and incorporate our prisoners into our social initiatives, like the book fair, as an ongoing problem. Currently, there are the prisoners from Caso Security, or the Security Bank case, who have been accused of participating in a bank robbery a few years ago. This is a famous case because it was one of the trials where the preventative detainment lasted the longest before they were found guilty. And beforehand, a few of them were at large for years abroad in Argentina. Then there's the case of Victor Montoya, who is awaiting trial. He is being accused of placing an explosive device at a police barracks. One of the most talked about cases that really changed everything is Caso Bombas, Bomb's case, from 2010. Right now, the only people from this case that are in prison, although for different reasons, are Francisco Solar and Monica Caballero, who are imprisoned in Spain. 
And they also speak about the cooperation between the governments of Spain and Chile, furthering their repressive logic, trying to find guilty parties where there are none. Caso Bombas was a very well-known case in Chile, because the 14 people accused and politically imprisoned for almost a year were all absolved. So this demonstrated that here in Chile, first, yes, there is political repression. Secondly, that the justifications for persecuting these supposed criminals are obviously absurd. And third, that the society itself and the task of protecting society through these institutional channels has shown the absurdity of the persecution in Chile against people of the anti-authoritarian tendency. Bueno, muchas gracias, Felipe. Gracias a usted y le mando un fuerte y caluroso abrazo a todos los compañeros de la región de Estados Unidos. Gracias. A usted es igual. In our next episode, we'll pick up on this theme of political repression and prisoner support as we continue our exploration of anarchism in Chile. We'll share two exciting interviews with recent anarchist political prisoners and discuss a documentary on Chilean anarchist struggles, along with current news updates from the streets of Santiago and plenty more.